Good morning, church. It's so good to see you. Great to be with you. Get to worship with you. It's just the best. It's a great day to praise the Lord. Amen. It surely is. Well, let's go ahead and head over to the Gospel of Luke, if we could. Uh, we're going to be in chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We're going to continue our study. Uh, and we are hearing Jesus teach uh, what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And so last week, we uh, examined the, some various blessings and woes that Jesus is describing uh, and explaining to his disciples. He, he is laying out the formula for what a disciple of Christ looks like. He, he's teaching them what a disciple ought to believe, but not only what they ought to believe, but he's instructing them on how to act as disciples in this world, because the truth is that when you are a regenerated believer in Jesus Christ, you act differently. You, you act differently. It changes your mind. He changes your heart. He changes your actions. And, and the, the Sermon on the Mount is such a wonderful teaching of our Lord that brings us yet again to surrender and obedience to what he's teaching. You know, when from the moment that we place our faith in Christ, our lives are forever changed. We live every day in this reality of the blood-bought redemption that was won for us on the cross. And so the Sermon on the Mount is a showcase of how we ought to live in this world. Reality. In fact, a uh, pastor and theologian, the 20th century, J. Gresham Machen, he put it this way, the Sermon on the Mount, along like the rest of the, the whole New Testament, really leads a man straight to the foot of the cross. That's what this passage does for us this morning. This is how we should see our lives as Christ followers with the cross in mind, with our Savior in mind, his commands in mind. So we, we come to a passage like the Sermon on the Mount, and so our ears, our ears better tune in to what the Lord is saying. So we're going to begin with a command of Jesus that should not come to us as a surprise, and it is the command of love. The command of love. So we're in Luke 6. I'm going to start in verse 27. But I say to you who hear, who is it that he's talking to? He's talking to his disciples. We learned that from last week. He's talking to his disciples. There's other people there probably, but he's addressing specifically those who follow me. Listen up. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Jesus, he's already in his teaching divided up the two types of people in the world. There are the people who follow God and there are the people who don't follow God. That there are those that are Christ's disciples and then those are, there are those who are the world's disciples. There are blessings for those who are in God's family. There are woes for those outside of it. And so these two types of people, they are not the same. They're not on the same team. There is hostility between the two. If you recall in verse 22 last week, Jesus states, blessed are you when people hate you. When they exclude you when they revile you, when they spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, Jesus teaches, and leap for joy. 
For behold, your reward is great in heaven. So we will inevitably have enemies. This is not new. We talked about this. We're going to talk about it again. We will not be surprised when we face enemies in this world as Christians. If you are a Christian and everybody gets along with you in this world, and you're just so pleasant, and you're so likable, and your worldview just fits right in with what everyone else believes, well, you you are either not spending enough time with people that share a different worldview from you, or, or you're not bringing Christ with you into those relationships, into your workplace, into your friendships, into your family, your extended families, So there is therefore no hostility toward you as a Christian because they probably don't even know it. Probably don't even know you're a Christian based on how you live and what you speak and how you interact. Now, do we live in such a way that we're just like belligerent Christians and we just wanna make enemies left and right and nobody wants to get along with us? No, I don't think so. I think Jesus has a higher way, has a better way but he is making it clear that people will hate you because they hated him first. And so so what should we do to these enemies? Well, we should just hate them right back, right? No. He says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. And what does this love look like? Well, it looks like that you do good to them. It looks like you bless them. It looks like you pray for them. It looks like you don't repay evil with evil. It looks like you are generous to them. And as the walls in my elementary school, I remember passing by it every day, as it would say, treat others the way that you want to be treated. This is the golden rule. You treat them With love, you love your enemies. You love your neighbors. The people who hate you. The people who exclude you. The people who revile you and spurn your name as evil. Jesus is saying, you love them. No matter the offense, the Christian is to show love toward their enemies, because love is such a foundational Christian ethic that it's not only necessary for those that love us, but it's also necessary for those who hate us. In fact, it is the foundational Christian ethic. If we we get love wrong, we get everything wrong. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is asked, we read, he's asked, teacher, what, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord with all, the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these commandments depends all the law and the prophets. All of the teaching of the scriptures, all of the law, all of the commandments that we have in the Bible have to do with these two great commandments. In this life, you will love God and you will love your neighbor. Again, there's nothing more central than love in the Christian life. In Galatians We read, for you were called to freedom, brothers, only not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We are commanded to love and to love in a radical way way, such a strange and counterintuitive way that we are to love our enemies because that costs a lot more than just me, like loving my kids, whom I do love. And from what I can tell, they love me. 
It's easy for me to love them. It is more costly when I'm asked to love my enemies. So I want to look at, for a moment, the cost of love in the Christian life. The cost of love. Jesus is calling us to a strange way of living where he would have us love our enemies. This is the type of stuff that would have the Pharisees fuming out of their ears because to them, loving God meant hating your enemies. And not only the Pharisees, but everyone in the audience had a mutual enemy of the Roman Empire, right? These are provocative words that Jesus is teaching. But Jesus is making the point that genuine love is costly. It's not supposed to be easy. Jesus is talking about a love that matters in his litmus test for determining if your love is genuine is if that love, if that same love can be taken and applied to both the people that you love and your enemies. If you can apply your love in both places, you have genuine love. You have genuine love. Let's continue in verse 32. If you, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. What good does it do to you if you're loving toward only the people that are loving in return? Jesus is saying, even your enemies are loving toward those who love them. Even sinners do that easy sort of love. And I don't know who your enemies are. I believe you have enemies. We all have an enemy, Satan, but there are enemies in this world that we have, I don't know who it is for you. In general, we do have movements in the world. We have ideologies. We have specific types of people that are, in fact, hostile toward Christians, toward you, toward me. Those people exist. You may have some of those people at your workplace, in the schools that you're in, Maybe in your family you've been cut off because of your faith in Christ. Let me just say that the, the very fact that not only are we commanded by the Lord to love these people, but we're actually capable of loving them, that shows that this type of love can only be accomplished by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We, we can't fathom loving people like that in our own flesh because it doesn't make sense. It's not natural for us to desire to love our enemies. I mean, look at what the world's standard for love is. It will always be conditional on you loving me, accepting me, and in return, I will love you. I have to have a reason to love you. You have to prove to me your loveliness and then I will love you. And the minute that you stop giving me that loveliness is the same minute that I stop loving you. See, the world's love is intolerant of enemies. If we were to look at the the sexual revolution that's taking place in the world and all of the progressive ideology that's flowing from it, that is a worldview that has no room for love toward its enemies. You are their enemy if you believe what the Bible says about sexuality, about gender. And let me tell you, they do not love you. They hate you. 
If you believe what the Bible says, they hate you. They have no gospel that results in them loving their enemies. There's no tolerance for disagreement. You must first confirm to what I say love is. And when you agree with me in every way, shape, or form, then you are welcomed into my life. Then I will love you. Then you are welcomed into this kingdom. What's happening in Israel in this very moment today and yesterday and the extremists that are bringing about this chaos is a result of a worldview that does not love their enemies. They would say, you do not love your enemies, you eliminate your enemies. And my, my friends, if they had the opportunity to attack us in this church this very moment, they would do it. There are people that hate Christians, that hate God's people that much. The extremists that are coming out of Iran and from Hamas, they will not be satisfied until every single Jew and Christian are wiped off the face of the earth. They've said that. Do you wanna know why? Because they do not love their neighbor. They do not operate from a worldview that provides hope to lost people. Instead, they seek the disposal of lost people. The elimination of lost people. And yet, even in this progressive landscape, in the anti-Christian worldview that's sweeping our nation, captivating entire generations, even the people within that, even the people in Hamas, even the people operating the drones and the missile strikes at this very moment, moment even our own enemies, our abusive parent, the drunk that hit our family's car, the abortionist, the politician, your boss, or a friend that's betrayed you, you are commanded to love them and to pray for them and to do good to them and be generous to them for the sake of extending the mercy of God that has been extended to you. To think that there is a sinner in this world that is too sinful to be saved means that we think our God is too weak. He's not capable. He doesn't have enough grace. He doesn't have enough mercy and he doesn't have enough love within him to save even the most wicked. As Christians, we do not desire that all of our enemies would be eliminated we desire that all of our enemies would repent. That they would come to faith in Christ. Yeah, yeah, we fight for injustice, right? We stand up for the wronged, for injustice in this world. God gave us civil law and order for us to apply in our society he gave us his law that governments should stand upon. He gave us ways to hold murderers and thieves and criminals accountable. God's law has to be upheld. But ultimately, God is out to save souls and for his church to witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and all of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth for people to be saved. In fact, in Romans 12, 19, it reminds us that vengeance is the Lord's. It is all his. It is completely his. He will deal with vengeance. He will repay. 
for all of the injustice that is dealt in this world now and that happens to us, there is perfect vengeance awaiting on the day of judgment. If you have been wronged, vengeance is his. If you have been hated, vengeance is his. If you've been insulted, vengeance is his. And for us now, today, we lovingly bring the gospel, the good news to our enemies. We pray for them. We earnestly seek the best possible thing for them, that they would surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and enjoy him forever. That is a costly love. And it will make you look foolish in the world when you start loving your enemies. So how how is this possible? Well, I wanna look now at and finish with this, the source of our love. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. You'll be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. See, if if we don't understand this dynamic, we will not understand love. Let me explain. Show mercy because God is merciful. Show grace because God is gracious. Show love because God is loving. And and we should be doing this. We should be extending these things, not because it's true that, that God is perfectly merciful and he's perfectly gracious and he is loving in general, right? That, that's true, but we should be doing these things because God is perfectly merciful and perfectly gracious and perfectly loving to you. To, to you, he is these things. You are the recipient of undeserved grace, of wrath withholding mercy, of blood shed love. You were the recipient of those things. And because you have received these things, you can give these things and you can give them freely. Do you understand? 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. This is how we can look into the world and see people doing evil things and and evil things happening to us and say that these people are equally in need of God's love as I am. See, our sin is no less sinful than theirs. Our brokenness is no less broken. In fact, we are just as unworthy of God's grace, of his mercy, and we cannot recognize our ability to love our enemies until we can recognize the depth of our own sin before a holy God, because we're unworthy. We are, we are unworthy So here's the truth. You are far more unworthy to receive grace from God than your enemy is unworthy to receive love from you. Think about that. You think they don't deserve love because of what they did to you? I don't deserve anything at all because of what I did to God. 
My sin against a holy God is a greater offense than anything anyone could ever do to me. I'm sinned against, I'm not holy. I'm a sinner, so, but God is holy and I sinned against him. This is an eternal, cosmic betrayal of God, of me turning away from God. We are commanded to love and this love that we will give is to be a love like nothing this world has to offer. And it will be given freely through us because it's been freely given to us. It's been freely given to us. You know, a testimony of what this love looks like um, is in the life of a Christian, a missionary, well-known missionary called Hudson Taylor. Um, He is known for essentially bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to most of China in the 19th century. Uh, He he worked through a ministry that he founded called China Inland Mission. Um, The impact of that mission is still saturating and still moving in China today. We wouldn't be surprised if there are more Christians in China than there are in America. God moved through this individual and this mission in mighty ways in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Because China wasn't an easy uh, area or easy country to evangelize to in the 19th century. It's very, very similar today. You can't, but we do. There was hostility toward any sort of Western influence in the country, any sort of colonialism, any sort of missionary activity. There was resistance, yet the Lord put this desire in Hudson Taylor's heart to reach China for Christ. For over 50 years, his entire life was dedicated to this mission. And throughout his mission work, he would encounter every single roadblock and government resistance that you can possibly imagine. Often it would result in missionaries and people that he's working with being killed and nearing death himself. You know, he would make a a total of 11 trips to China. Many of these would be multiple years that he would be there working with the people in China. And China Inland Mission, uh, the organization, would grow to have over 300 missionaries in China reaching this country for Christ. In the year 1900, a tragic uprising of local militias, of resistance forces, they were ordered to attack and kill any foreigners and any missionaries that they come across. So the local civilians and militias and the people in the community, they were ordered to, to kill any sort of foreigner that they encounter. Uh, this event is called the Boxer Rebellion Uh, And the target of this order largely was these missionaries because not only did they not look like they were from China, they were bringing the gospel and they weren't apologetic about it. They, they, They were spreading the good news of the gospel and people hated them for it. During this event, this uprising, there were 58 of their missionaries killed. Um, There were 21 of their children that were also killed. It was horrific. They were martyred for bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost nation. And what is moving is that none of the surviving missionaries, nobody in the organization desired vengeance to their oppressors. There's no record of any vengeance asked by the people in the organization because they thought it was necessary, in their words, to represent the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And what's profound are the words of a mother that during the attack, she 
encountered such brutal wounds and she survived initially from the attack. Her daughter was killed and she fled the scene with her husband and she was minutes, possibly hours from facing death herself. She knew she was gonna die. She was just trying to get back to find any sort of doctor, any sort of aid. And along the way, it's recorded that she told her husband as she was about to die, I wish I could have lived. I wish I could have gone back there to tell the dear people more about Jesus. I wish I could have lived. I wish I could have gone back there to tell the dear people more about Jesus. To go back there where my daughter was killed. To go back there where I was killed. To a place where we would say she lost everything. She needed to return to tell the dear people more about Jesus, the very people that killed her daughter, the very people that killed her fellow missionaries, to tell them more about Jesus. You know, she did not lose anything at all. In fact, she was moments away from gaining everything. Hudson Taylor was not present during these attacks. He was ill uh, and he was healing in Europe uh, when he heard of the news of what happened. His very words were this. Oh, think what it must have been to exchange that murderous mob for the rapture of his presence, his bosom, his smile. He said, they do not regret it now. They do not regret it now. All of it was worth it because they're with him now. He would eventually heal and return to China for his last mission trip where um, there he would die and the Lord would call him home. Again, we are commanded to love and this love that we will give is going to look like nothing this world has to offer. And we will give it freely because it was given to us freely. Let's pray. Lord, teach us the kind of love where we can look at our enemies and pray for the salvation of their souls. Pray for the well-being of their life. Lord, that they would be a recipient of your grace. That they would see how loving you are. How life-changing your gospel is. Lord, when I look around, I don't want to hate my enemies. I want to love them and reach them for your name. Lord, that they would turn from their sin, that they would turn from their wickedness, and that you would be glorified in their lives. Lord, what a blessing that would be for them. I know because it was a blessing for me when you turned my life around, when you gave us grace, when you saved us. 
Lord, would we see the world through your eyes? And would we be obedient to extend your mercy and your grace and your love to this broken world? Lord, it is all for your name's sake, for your wonderful name. And it is in that lovely name we pray, Jesus.